see that for for animals, this would become like a commercially available uh, therapy. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're aiming to be on the market in 2024, conditionally approved. Um, this, there's something that's called expanded approval in uh, the animal health space, where if you have a life-threatening disease and you're able to show a reasonable expectation of efficacy and safety, that you're able to get something called conditional approval. Um, and that's what we're aiming for by 2024. A uh, similar time frame to our human health development, where we're moving into clinical trials and hope to be in clinical trials by 2024 as well, because there's a large overlap with the um, preclinical work that you would do for humans and the clinical safety study that you do for uh, animal health. I did want to kind of ask about next steps and, and how you would move on to uh, humans trials. How much precedent is there for gene therapy with the FDA? I mean, it seems it's... I mean, it's not the same as taking a, a small molecule which, which will be gone from your body in a, a reasonable period of time. Are they more concerned about gene therapy? I would say um, they're definitely more careful about longer term studies. Um, they want you to follow up after approval for a much longer period of time than previous uh, drugs, but you, you already have two approvals for AAV specifically in the US. You have a third approval in Europe um, from Biomarin's new um, hemophilia therapeutic, uh, which I'm sure will be coming to the US shortly. Um, and so it's not unprecedented. Uh, gene therapy has been around for a very long time, but you've only started to have approvals within the last five years. Uh, Spark, Spark Therapeutics was the first, quickly followed by Avexis, uh, slash, which is now owned by Novartis. Um, and uh, um, now Biomarin is entering the space with their gene therapy as well. And so it's not unprecedented. Uh, it's becoming more and more familiar. They actually had to create a new special task force to evaluate gene therapies at the FDA because there's so many applications for gene, uh, cell and gene therapy uh, therapeutics. In humans, the, the indication you'd be looking at would be this heart, um, I, I forgot what you called it. Uh, yeah, ARVC. Uh, ARVC. AR yeah, um, that will be our first indication. It's an orphan disease, high unmet need. There basically isn't really a medication that can reverse the disease. Normally a treatment involves uh, beta blockers uh, and um, uh, defibrillator implanted in, there, in your heart. So if your heart gets so crazy that it stops beating, it will shock you back to life because that's a very common aspect of this disease. But uh, you just, it's a, it's a, disease that you're you're on the railroad tracks and and there is no way to kind of slow the progression of this disease thus far um about 130,000 patients in the US and uh you know and and we we believe that RJB01 should have a very high likelihood of success being able to treat ARVC uh and so we can make a huge difference in this patient population This video is brought to you by Bioptimizers. Magnesium is a crucial mineral for hundreds of reactions in the body and impacts everything, including sleep and muscle and bone health. It is difficult to get sufficient magnesium through our food. In our efforts to remain fit and healthy, my wife and I frequently exercise, after which it's important to recover well and get restful sleep. To help us with this, we chose Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizer because it blends all seven essential forms of magnesium into one effective supplement, while also using all natural ingredients and being gluten, soy, and lactose free. It has improved our recovery and sleep quality since we've been taking it. And we are happy to tell you that Bioptimizers are offering a 10% discount for Magnesium Breakthrough to Modern Health Span audience. Just go to www.magnesiumbreakthrough.com modern or click on the link in the description to get a 10% discount with coupon code MODERN10. Thank you for your support. And what are the characteristics of an orphan disease, you said? Uh, just based on the number of patients. Um, and uh, so I believe it's, uh, under 200,000 patients and you're qualified as an orphan disease. Okay. So ARVC, does it affect young people? And would young people not have sufficient FGF21 already? Yeah. So um, 
ARVC does affect, it, it is a progressive disease. So the mm-hmm. older you get, the more affected you are. And I think this is a, you know, something that is not um, appreciated amongst basically all diseases, even ones that aren't necessarily age associated. Um, Like ALS, for instance, you know, a 20 year old with ALS doesn't usually have symptoms, but a 30 year old will. Um, A a 15 year old with ARVC, depending on the genetic background, won't necessarily have um, debilitating symptoms. But as you progress in the disease, as you become 25 or 30 or 40, it becomes worse and worse. So it's not that um, it's not that they don't have it when they're younger. It's that it becomes worse and worse of a problem as your network becomes dysregulated. And so by stopping the pathogenesis of fibrotic development, as well as continuing to have the heart function better with increased FGF21, allows you to forestall the effects of this disease and keep the heart functioning properly over a longer period of time. Thinking about the future um, in terms of uh, rejuvenate bio. So where, would you see this as becoming like a preventative injection? So, so you could go and get preve- some, some preventative uh, therapy so that you would be more immune to the, some of the, age, the diseases of aging. Yeah, I think that uh, you, you really struck on an important chord there is that um, the safety of a therapeutic matters quite a bit. And we started at a place where we chose the gene targets based on some of the best safety data out there, which is that not only did these therapies ameliorate and increase health span, but they made the mice live longer. And so the quote unquote side effect is a benefit. There isn't really a drug out there that you would take as a healthy person yet, because they're usually targeted, very narrowly targeted to a specific disease state Everybody going after heart failure tries to only interact at the heart level. Everybody going after kidney failure only tries to act in the kidneys. And so when you take this whack-a-mole narrow approach to different diseases, you end up trying to mess with very important pathways that you're hoping to not have terrible side effects that outweigh the benefits of that therapeutic. We're coming at it more holistically where we start with something that is generally beneficial for the organism and try to apply it to specific disease states that should benefit from you being healthier and younger. And so uh, FGF21 and TGF beta safety is, it's been so extremely safe. We haven't had any, any side effects in all the dogs and mice that we've ever injected. So we're extremely excited about that. And as we continue to show the safety of this therapeutic, as well as its benefits in different disease states, you could anticipate that this would become something that might be prescribed uh, as a preventative to lots of different diseases. But that all depends on the safety versus the efficacy. And if your safety is good enough that a healthy person would take it, then you start to get into that possibility where it could be like a preventative. Yes. So just think about the kind of price. I mean, how, how difficult is it to make this uh, therapy? And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm sure you can't talk about price, but like roughly, I mean, is it like really expensive or kind of a reasonable? Um, yeah, I mean, so gene therapy right now is driven by the size of the dose and the dose is driven by how large you are. It's based on uh, per kilogram. And so dogs are generally a lot smaller than people, um, especially the small dogs who are weighing uh, at most 10 kilograms. Um, Mm -hmm. And so the dose for them is a lot smaller. So it's a lot more manageable from um, a production standpoint. And right now in the gene therapy and in healthcare in general, you don't pay for a drug based on how much it costs to produce. It's how much perceived goodness comes of that therapeutic, how much benefit you get from living an extra couple of years or preventing, um, you know, symptoms in this disease state. And so we're not really worried about the price of the production of the gene therapy. Mm-hmm. That's not what really drives the price of current gene therapies right. uh, or other therapeutics as well. Yeah. Okay. It's a more expensive modality for sure compared to a small molecule but it's not prohibitively more expensive.